Good evening and welcome to the Iridex Corporation webinar, Optimizing Micropulse Transcleral Cyclophotocoagulation for Multiple Glaucoma Types. My name is Kevin LaMarche. I'm the Director of Clinical Education and I will be the moderator for this webinar tonight. This evening, we are fortunate to have Dr. Nathan Radcliffe, Associate Clinical Professor of Ophthalmology at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary and the New York Eye Surgery Center with us. Dr. Radcliffe will be sharing his experience and expertise utilizing micropulse transcleral cyclophotocoagulation across many types of glaucoma within his practice. Following tonight's presentations, we will open the floor for questions. You will need to utilize the Q&A button on the top of the Zoom application on the right-hand side to ask those questions to us, and then we will relay them to Dr. Radcliffe in sequence. Now let's get started. The Iridex Cyclo G6 is an 810 nanometer diode laser, utilizes thermal coagulative effects and tissue necrosis. The target chromophore or tissue for this particular wavelength is melanin or pigment. Melanin and pigment resides throughout the eye itself, but for us, in our intensive purposes, the ciliary body is what we're most concerned with. There are other chromophores as well that also absorb 810 nanometer wavelength, and it's very important that you understand as you may come across some of these while you're treating. Unoxygenated and oxygenated hemoglobin both absorb this energy at a coefficient factor greater than one. So understanding that can lead you to not want to treat over a subconjunctival hemorrhage, or if you have a very injected red eye conjunctivally, you may want to use a blanching agent to try to remove that from the process to be able to deliver all the energy to your target chromophore in the pigment. It's also important to understand that marking pen spots, if you're utilizing transillumination, will also mimic melanin and absorb that energy. So it's important not to treat over those pen spot marks. The Cyclo G6 operates in two different modes, continuous wave mode, which we utilize the G-probe and the G-probe illuminate delivery device, or micropulse mode, where we utilize the MP3 probe. If you look at light absorption by ocular tissue, you can see the brown line represents melanin. The red and purple line are oxygenated and unoxygenated hemoglobin. The blue line is water, and the green line is proteins. Basically, all of the medical lasers that we use operate on these five chromophores, and it's very important to understand what coefficient factor they absorb at what wavelength. All of these lasers operate on the basic physics of light and photons disbursement. So basically you're going to get reflection, absorption, and transmission of those photons from this beam path. Scatter is actually a very complex version of reflection. But if you look at the target tissue, which is conjunctiva through sclera into the ciliary body, that will be your beam path for how you're treating with the MP3 device and you can actually see kind of an inverted cone application of how that laser path of photons is dispersed throughout the beam. It's very important to know that this is not a 50 micron or a 100 micron spot laser. This is a cloud of photons being delivered to the tissue, and that cloud can be up to a millimeter and a half wide at its widest points. So understanding this dials in the importance of how you have to have proper technique so that we're not directing these photons to tissues that we don't want to be absorbing it. It's very important when you're delivering this type of energy through a contact laser delivery system that you maintain good contact and you have excellent tissue coupling. On the left-hand side of the slide, we actually see on sclera with 810 nanometers what the type of reflection, transmission, and absorption can be. 60% being reflected, around 33% being transmitted, and the absorptive factor is actually relatively low at about 6%. It highlights the importance of having good coupling because if you're losing energy on the front end, 
you're not getting the absorptive factor you need to get an efficacious treatment on the other side. The slide on the right-hand side actually shows you just the difference between gentle pressure with contact laser delivery systems and with firm pressure. And by applying firm pressure, you can actually add about a 1.4 coefficient of greater energy being distributed into the tissue than you do with gentle pressure. So you can see how important it is to have all of these contact pressure to get the types of transmission and energy absorption that you desire. Along with that, you will get some reflection, but if you're, if you're poorly coupled with the tissue, uh, it's very, very likely that you're going to lose up to about 45 to 50% of that laser energy prior to it even being delivered into the conjunctiva itself. On the left-hand side of, of this slide, the line in the middle is sclera. The balloon to the left-hand side of the sclera is actually reflection, and to the right-hand side is actually the amount of energy being transmitted. And if you look at 804 nanometers, there's a fair amount of reflection being here, which is energy that is lost and not being delivered to the target tissue. On the right-hand side, you can see good tissue coupling with relatively low reflection uh, and a lot of energy being delivered where it needs to be. So having good coupling, which is both pressure and having a good coupling agent with the MP3 probe are imperative to getting good outcomes. So when we look at transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, uh, continuous wave TSCPC has been around for about 20 years. And by delivering thermal energy in a single discrete application, you can deliver high IOP lowering effects. And this can be obtained within a moderate to severe complication profile. The original classical technique, the complications were much higher. Now that Dr. Douglas Gastelin had come up with a slow burn technique where we're delivering less energy but over a longer period of time, we've actually moved that complication profile up some, but still reserving this for more severe to end-stage glaucoma-type treatments. Micropulse takes that exact same diode laser in a continuous mode, and it chops that beam up into small thermal packets of gentle energy. And by doing so, it allows us to basically introduce a small thermal relaxation period. And so you're not getting that continuous kind of exponential heat transfer that you do with continuous wave, but instead a much more gentle kind of non-expansive insult that we're in, you know, putting into the ciliary body. Um, and then by applying it over a much wider swath of tissue, by moving the probe back and forth, that in itself lessens that load and makes it a much higher safety profile so that now it can be introduced into much better seeing eyes in an in a earlier stage of glaucoma paradigm. Both of them work off pretty much the same mechanism of actions. You have a decrease in aqueous production. Uh, you have an increase in uveal scleral outflow, both by adding space to allow for the negative pressure gradient in the superciliary space to draw fluid into it, as well as enhancing scleral absorption too. And then the third mechanism of action is by contracting the longitudinal ciliary muscles, you can actually pull all the way to scleral spur and displace it, which then in turn will put pressure on the trabeculum and lower the resistance of the trabecular meshwork. So, in short, it's a very multifactorial mechanism of action. What we can't tell you is exactly what percentage is going where, but we do know in continuous wave, we do affect inflow to a greater degree than we do with the micropulse treatment. We have three different types of delivery devices for the cycle G6, the G-probe and the G-probe Illuminate, which are for continuous wave treatments, and then currently our MP3 device for micropulse mode. And they do treat a little bit differently in terms of the angle and the technique that's utilized with it. It's very important to understand the probe design. So if you look at this, you can see the notch, uh, which is 
oriented towards the limbus. You have a flat side of the probe, which is oriented towards the lid. And then offset in the center is the fiber optic. And it's a bubble fiber that we've created for safety so that it's smooth, hopefully doesn't catch on the conjunctiva and induce any complications. But in making that bubble fiber, it's important to understand that we have to burn and melt that fiber. In doing so, we actually burn off the insulation and cladding that wraps the fiber itself. In doing so, that insulation and cladding acts as the mirror for that photons of light energy that are bouncing back and forth at different indices, but it's the cladding and insulation that are actually colonizing and moving those photons forward. Now that it's been burnt off to create this bubble fiber, those photons have the opportunity at certain indices to move sideways and basically reflect off of the tissue. So you hear us talk constantly about the mandatory requirement of a viscous interface that needs to be used with both the G-probe and the MP3. They're both designed in the same way. And that is a mandatory requirement. Otherwise, you're going to lose about 45% of the energy before you even deliver it through the conjunctiva. If you look at the probe, it actually also shows you kind of the measurements here of the fiber to the front of the notch and to the interior component of the notch, as well as the short side of the probe. And it's important to understand that because if you were to orient this upside down, that fiber is now going to be much closer to the limbus, and you possibly could be delivering that energy to corneal tissue, to the iris root, to the ciliary artery and nerve, and those are places we really don't want that energy to be dispersed to. On the right-hand side, I'm going to show you a demonstration of why that liquid interface is mandatory. We have a Petri dish with balanced salt solution and an envelope underneath as a target, and what we do is take the MP3 probe from air, put it into that BSS, and then pull it back out. And you can actually see what that beam profile looks like. And as that probe comes back out, you'll see those photons actually being dispersed. So we're in air here, into the liquid, and now we pull back. And it's quite dramatic. So if you're delivering without a liquid interface and a good coupling agent, what's going to happen is half of those photons are not going to be delivered to the target tissue. One more time. So the surgical technique for Microplus is not simple. Um, and, you know, there are some steps that you have to maintain in terms of getting this energy to where it needs to be. So the orientation of the probe, as I said, the notch towards the limbus and the flat side of the probe toward the lids. In terms of how you place it, the outer edge of that notch is going to be on the surgical limbus, but it's very important to look over the probe so that you have correct parallax to judge that that probe isn't hanging over the limbus because now that fiber would be much closer and you'd be delivering energy closer to the tissues that you don't want to be absorbing them. We want to make sure we have that viscous interface. Again, a mandatory requirement to have good coupling. We want to be aiming with the probe towards the center of the globe. If you were to drop your elbow and that angle would then be more so towards the limbus or the iris root, there again, that cloud of photons is going to be delivered to tissue that we don't want to be absorbing this energy, and you can get a higher degree of complications. We want to make sure that we apply adequate pressure. And when I say that, like a pen to paper will be adequate. If you don't have adequate pressure, you're not getting that extra degree of coupling and you're not getting that energy into the tissue as you need be. We want to make five passes per treatment duration. So if you're doing a hemispheric approach, six clock hours, you're going to make five passes for 80 sec within the 80 seconds. If you're doing a quadrant approach, you're going to do five passes for 40 seconds. It's also very important to ensure that you have adequate exposure. Some people tend to use a speculum, others do not. It's up to you, whatever makes you feel more comfortable and gives you the best control. 
But I, I suggest that you take a practice pass. That way you can see if there are any pitfalls or any things that are going to run into your you know, range or give you some difficulty. Making that pass, just make sure that you don't run into things when you're treating. And being comfortable is one of the most important things. If you're comfortable, you can then focus on your technique. If you're not comfortable, it's very difficult to focus and you're more so just trying to get through the treatment. So for good things, we need to have that liquid interface. We need to have the right probe orientation. We need to be the right position from the limbus, the angle of the probe, pressure. Hemisphere or quadrant really is up to you, whatever makes you more comfortable. And then the sweep time, that five passes per duration. If you remember that, that way, whatever technique you're doing, it's still going to be five passes. And then your power settings. So we recommend 2,000 milliwatts. And some of our speakers in the webinars are using different powers, and they'll explain why. But when you're getting started, it is very important to stick to the recommended requirements. I would say that 85 to 90 percent of our users actually get excellent results at these standard settings, some based on maybe retreatments or higher degrees of glaucoma with patients who have had multiple surgeries and multiple medications over their lifetime may require more, but everybody who has changed their power and the duration has gotten there through science and by optimizing their technique over time. It's very important not to jump out and use other people's settings without understanding all of the variables and also understanding what paradigm of glaucoma they're treating and what their technique is. And then the duration, again, 80 seconds for the hemisphere, hemisphere or 40 seconds for a per quadrant. If you don't do them correctly and you have deficiencies in your technique, these are the things that can go wrong. So, you know, without the liquid interface, you could lose 50% of the energy and have a non-efficacious treatment. If the probe orientation is, is inappropriate or incorrect, you're now going to move the fiber closer to the limbus and some of the complications that we see in terms of medriasis or enhancement of dry eye symptoms could be exasperated because you're much closer to the limbus. Angle of the probe, you want to keep that energy on, focused on the ciliary body and not towards tissue. You don't want absorbing it. And pressure, we want to make sure we have that pressure so that the coupling will be good and we're delivering all the possible energy that we can to the target tissue. With the hemisphere quadrant approach, they both work well. It's really which one makes you more comfortable. And I think it's important to understand that MicroPulse can be utilized, you know, prior to in conjunction with and following any other glaucoma surgery or therapy. So we, we talk about, you know, post-failed MIGS procedures, pre-trabeculectomy and tube shunt, post-trabeculectomy and tube shunt. There are a lot of opportunities to utilize this device and really make it a viable weapon in your glaucoma portfolio. Now, I'm going to hand the talk off to Dr. Nathan Radcliffe, and uh, following his presentation, we'll then open up the floor to questions and answers. So please, Nathan, I will turn this over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your uh, your science there. Uh, that was just fantastic. Uh, I have been doing MicroPulse for uh, f four years, and of course, diode before that. Uh, it's worth noting that my um, my first MicroPulse procedure four or so years ago was probably also my last diode procedure, you know, date, because um, I have completely transitioned over to uh, using MicroPulse, even if I have a case that one might think would traditionally be for diabasers. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and, you know, I can, I can testify that, uh, and I think this was known with traditional diode laser, is that uh, once you get to that six-month point with MicroPulse, um, the duration of efficacy seems to continue on uh, in a pretty reliable manner uh, at that point in time. So um, with that, I'll show a case uh, that I did. Um, I use retrovolbar blocks for all of my cases. Uh, you'll see me trying to push. This is a tight orbit. Uh, I find a speculum doesn't always help me get more posterior. Um, 
I use a retro bull bar block. Uh, I've had this conversation with, you know, if it's under 100 ophthalmologists, I'll be surprised. A lot of folks, you know, like to use a, a peri bull bar block. You know, and my response is, well, I'm going to stick with my retro bull bar block, but you, you can, you know, do what you like. Um, I just don't ever want to have myself in a situation where I'm limiting the power I deliver, limiting the duration of treatment because the patient's uncomfortable. Uh, of course, the other way to go on this is just to use something like propofol and have the patient very briefly uh, sedated uh, without the block. Uh, and I haven't used that technique, but I've certainly met some ophthalmologists who have. Uh, you know, the, the key principles to me that I've learned over time um, are to go a little more posteriorly. And, and, you know, as we're looking at this image in front of me, I'm a little closer to the limbus than I'd like to be. Um, so giving a couple extra millimeters of space there, I don't think there's any problem going um, too on the posterior side. I think where you run into trouble uh, is really going too anteriorly and you know, putting yourself at risk uh, of treating the limbus. I think treating the limbus, uh, in addition to causing you know, PAS and uh, things like that, I think that's where you get into damaging tissue around the limbus, which includes limbal stem cells um, and uh, some nerve tissue. Uh, I also avoid, uh, you know, the three and nine o'clock um, out of an abundance of caution. Uh, I certainly have treated, I'm sure, over 100 eyes where I went a complete 360 and didn't avoid uh, those areas. Um, but I, I think, uh, particularly as you use higher settings, it makes sense to spare that tissue. Uh, I know you can still get an excellent treatment effect if you spare that tissue uh, based on what you believe the mechanism of action to be. Um, you know, if you believe you're getting some low-grade inflammation and getting uveoscleral outflow as a, a potential mechanism, it shouldn't hurt you to just avoid a few areas with your treatment. Um, so, um, I have here my poster, uh, uh, which actually now is a published manuscript um, uh, describing a, a little difference in technique. So when I started using this laser uh, many years ago, um, at that point in time, um, you know, we, we really were kind of figuring out the settings on our own. And I, I started using higher settings if I needed more pressure reduction, uh, whereas some of my colleagues would go with longer and longer durations. Uh, and see, so what you're seeing here um, are my patients uh, treated for the variety of settings, always with a total of 100 seconds. So I treat 50 seconds superiorly, 50 seconds inferiorly, 100 seconds total. And if I feel I need, you know, more of an effect, I've increased the power. And, and this was from my observation with endocyclophotocoagulation, where if you just hover with the laser over ciliary process and wait longer, uh, typically, a lot doesn't happen, but if you increase the power, you'll see a change in how much blanching occurs. And so I thought, well, if I want to get more of a tissue treatment, I'll increase the power. Uh, I used four settings um, between 2,000 um, and 2,500 milliwatts. And, and in my study, I basically varied the treatment based on the patient's visual acuity. So if someone had excellent visual acuity, 2020, 2040, they got 2,000 milliwatts. Um, but as the vision fell, uh, I went with more and more aggressive settings, uh, such that, you know, an eye with uh, light perception or, you know, hand motion um, vision might, might end up getting, uh, you know, 2,500 milliwatts and, and everything in between. Um, and what you could see is, uh, to begin with, all comers, I had excellent pressure reduction, you know, 10 millimeters uh, of pressure reduction. And I think that was something like a 40%, maybe even a 45% pressure reduction. Uh, and, and that's notable because, you know, in all the glaucoma surgical trials we see, uh, you, you typically won't get quite that much. Um, next is a good duration of efficacy and stability between one month and one to two years. Uh, and I think that's notable. Um, and some good medication reduction. And I think we had, and, and this was important for my group, um, you know, we had some uh, excellent, yeah, 73% of patients were able to get off a of carbonic and hydrase inhibitor, which, you know, as you know, is really um, means that you're having a big impact on, on their pressure. Um, so this was a long-term study. It was retrospective, but to me, it, it sort of 
uh, at least explain the potential benefits of using these different settings uh, when the disease calls for it. Um, I'll go through uh, just a few cases here. Um, and uh, this, this one is a relatively early case. We're talking about the left eye, 24 millimeters of mercury on three drops. The eyes had SLT. The patient doesn't want surgery. Uh, I'm showing you the OCT with retinal nerve fiber layer damage in the left eye. I'm showing you the macula too. That's important because you know, if, if you don't know what the macula looks like before you do uh, this laser, then you, know, you might end up blaming something in the macula on the laser that was there the whole time. Uh, so I always get, uh, and I'll just say this rule, every nerve OCT always comes with a macular OCT for every patient, every visit, zero exceptions, no arguments. Uh, I always scan the macula because it's, it's where glaucoma lives. We can see it there. Um, Patients can get CME from tubes, cataract surgery, and so I don't, I don't want to go in without knowing that's present. Um, this patient had a decent visual field. Uh, as you can see, just a little bit of damage in the left eye, but with an elevated pressure uh, on many treatments, not wanting surgery, micropulse seemed very reasonable. Uh, patient had excellent visual acuity. I think this is a great case to start with standard settings, 2,000 milliwatts. Um, I give the two 50 second treatments for a total of uh, 100 seconds. I think uh, what's more common out there, you know, with other surgeons is to go for 80 seconds for a total of 160 seconds. Uh, and, and I have no issue with that. It's just not what I've been doing. So I haven't changed. And again, I think that speaks to what Kevin said about sort of know, know what works in your hands. And, um, you know, you don't want to just jump to someone else's settings if you're comfortable with what you have. Uh, th this part I consider to be non-negotiable is, is you just must give a subconjunctival injection of a, a steroid at the conclusion of the procedure. That can be um, subconjunctival dexamethasone, which is what I use, um, or uh, solumedrol would be reasonable. I don't think triamcinolone is quite what you're looking for because it just hangs around a little long. Um, the, the key here is that it must be given when the procedure is done. The, day one would be too late because with micropulse, the, the name of the game is staying ahead of the inflammation. And if you have inflammation under control at day one, then you've got it made. Uh, if you have uh, exuberant fibrin response at day one, which I've had maybe once or twice, and I, I can explain why a little bit, um, then, then you're behind, and it actually takes quite a while to catch up. So I always give the injection, how much dexamethasone, answer um, standard injection uh, that you would give after a cataract surgery would be similar. Uh, there's really not, not a too much of a dose. You're going to give as much as you can hold in the conjunctiva. Um, and um, the, the one time where you may see exuberant inflammation is in darkly pigmented uh, eyes. And, you know, I say that, but really uh, I'm talking about patients who have a lot of pigment uh, in their skin as well, uh, since that seems to correlate. Um, patients who are more deeply pigmented, of course, uh, can have more pigment uh, in their ciliary body and can absorb the laser energy, as Kevin was describing. And I will often back my laser settings off a little bit in those patients uh, in order to avoid uh, additional inflammation. Um, so that's the treatment for this patient. And what then is going to happen, uh, I, I will maybe, yes, maybe no see pressure reduction day one. But most importantly, uh, this is someone who will be on prednisolone four times a day for a week. I do not see them day one, but I see them week one. At week one, if they are not uh, sensitive to light, if their eye is quiet, I just stop the prednisolone. Uh, and I guess in the rare, rare uh, situation where they're still inflamed, I would do a, a 4 3 two, one taper over a month. Uh, and I want to stress that because I get ahead of the inflammation, that's, that's very rare. Um, the next case is, uh, you know, it's a patient who's uh, a little bit more severe. This is someone whose pressure is 28 now on four medications. The patient has had cataract surgery with a, a MIGS procedure. And um, the vision's a little bit more reduced. I'll just point out to you, if you look at the left eye visual field, you can see the foveal sensitivity there is 27 decibels. And that's, that's an eye that's not going to see normally. And that's because the glaucoma has affected the central vision. 
Um, and a patient's had a prior micropulse. And so this comes up, I think, one of the most frequent questions I'll hear is, you know, I did a micropulse. Um, it seemed to work for a little while. It wore off. Uh, but the patient didn't have any side effects. Uh, and so let's address how to treat that patient. Um, this is someone where I would up the power. Uh, again, um, I'm not so worried about making this patient's vision worse with any side effect uh, from inflammation. Uh, CME is exceptionally rare. Uh, by the way, in my study with 100 eyes, um, I, I don't know if we, if we thought there was one case of CME uh, attributable to the micropulse, or if there were zero, there were four or five people who had CME prior to their micropulse. And that's important to recognize is that you're far more likely to do a micropulse on someone who has it from something else than you are to cause it uh, if you have a, a standard glaucoma practice. Um, in any case, this patient gets a higher treating in the treatment. And I explained to the patient, hey, I didn't want to use the higher energy the first time because we want to see how your eye responded. We can always treat again. We can always use more energy next time. Can't go back. And um, <clears throat> in, um, uh, in this patient, I keep this amount of time I'm treating the same. I still use the dexamethasone. Um, and uh, so this patient, um, you know, Again, the treatment is going to be the same uh, following, including the taper. Here's a patient, uh, this is the third case here with severe glaucoma, um, hand motion vision, um, RNFL loss, diffuse, it's in the macula, you see on the macular OCT, there's thinning, there's maybe a little bit of old CME that's not active now. That might prompt me to use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory if I'm treating with micropulse. Um, you know, I know the questions that come up, can you treat someone with CME, with a history of CME with micropulse? You can. I, I give some thought to whether it's been tough to control the CME and, you know, whether I might bring that back. Um, or, um, you know, in some patients, uh, like this one with hand motion vision, I don't think CME recurrence is going to affect how well they see. Uh, so I just try to keep all that in perspective. I would use an NSAID, though, uh, to stay ahead of things. Uh, the patient's on Diamox and drops, had a failed trabeculectomy, uh, and has, has, uh, is on Coumadin. And just to kind of cover that, there, there are about 20 triggers in my practice for um, micropulse over some other intervention. Um, and, you know, I'll just give you a few. Uh, one is, you know, they're on, on a blood thinner. Uh, the age here, 85, is where glaucoma surgery that's incisional starts to become much less attractive. The choroid is much more interested in expanding uh, from a tube or a trab in an older individual. Um, bleeding, choroidal hemorrhages, really a, a risk factor uh, in, in the elderly. Uh, similarly, a patient with severely uncontrolled high blood pressure is, you know, I had a dialysis patient the other day that I did micropulse on because I've seen a lot of choroidal uh, effusions in, as the fluid shifts during uh, dialysis. Um, Monocular patients are often good micropulse candidates because uh, they need a, less of a downtime visually and recovering from incisional glaucoma surgery takes longer. And, you know, those few complications that take a few weeks or a month uh, to resolve can be devastating in mono monocular people. Uh, people who've had a bad complication from glaucoma surgery in the fellow eye are sort of micropulse, uh, you know, candidates in my mind, um, as well as people who've had a history of infection. Uh, or people who, um, you know, in, in my estimation, are at super high risk, and those would include those with um, MADI blepharitis uh, at, at the slit lamp, where I'm, you know, trying to imagine how uncomfortable I would feel doing glaucoma surgery with eyelashes that, that look like that. Patients who have proven to be inconsistent with taking uh, post-operative medications, patients with uh, problems keeping their drops straight. So, you know, patients whose caregivers are unable to reliably deliver, say, hourly prednisolone, which, you know, can be needed after trabeculectomy and things like that. So, you know, all of these different uh, patient features or triggers for me for micropulse, and it ends up being uh, something I'm doing, you know, three of these procedures a week. Um, and, and that's just, uh, you know, servicing a fraction. I still perform, of course, all the other incisional glaucoma surgeries. Um, but so here we have someone who, you know, is having a little pain in their eye. The pressure's 42. I do believe in treating that type of pressure because, you know, if, if he, he's at high risk for vein occlusion and all these other problems, 
Uh, and if we can just safely get the pressure lower, I think the patient and the eye will be happier. So um, this patient is going to get, uh, again, a, a higher micropulse treatment, 22, 100 milliwatts. Um, and I may even go a little higher, maybe uh, 2350, 2400. Uh, I treat eyes at 2,500 milliwatts in many cases um, if, um, if, if they're like perception vision, um, you know, painful eyes. Uh, and, and you will occasionally even hear a pop with micropulse. So I think as you get to these higher settings, you're definitely moving from, you know, the sort of micropulse mechanism into more of a traditional diode. But again, a pop is very rare, even with a 2,500 milliwatt micropulse whereas it's very common with traditional continuous wave um, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. Um, so, you know, these, these are uh, some cases here. Um, I uh, hope that gives you sort of just a good overview of how I approach the procedure. Um, and so uh, I am happy to take questions. Um, Let's see, I, I, uh, the, the instructions for how to ask a question are, I think if you go to the top of your screen, there's a Q&A button, and you can click on the Q&A button, um, and then you uh, will be able to type in your question there. And uh, I think Kevin is going to help me by sort of uh, moderating uh, these questions. Uh, yes, yes, that's exactly how you ask a question. We already have some, so we'll get started. Um, post transcranial cyclophotocoagulation, uh, pupillary medriasis, so either temporary or permanent medriasis, possible ideology and possible management of those cases? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I have seen uh, a case, um, and I've heard about a few. Uh, and this one, I think, is a little puzzling. Um, it certainly makes sense from, you know, a mechanistic standpoint that uh, the ciliary nerve has been affected. Um, now, um, if it's a nerve that's been affected, we should be able to use an agent like pilocarpine uh, to shrink the pupil. If you have a pupil that's immobile, um, you know, that's a little harder to understand. Uh, you, you know, you could think about whether there's some inflammation. Uh, in some cases, they'll resolve and get better. Um, I um, uh, so, you know, I think for me there, that's the only really strong reason to avoid the three and nine o'clock areas with your treatment. And um, I, I will say that since I uh, changed my technique eh, two years ago to avoiding the three and nine o'clock, I haven't seen any um, medriasis, but again, it was always very rare for me to begin with. It does seem to happen a little bit more in younger patients, and I, and I don't know why that is. Um, it's it's you know it's a little bit of a puzzle, um, but it's a rare side effect. Uh, probably worth mentioning to patients. Uh, and again, uh, I think um, it can sometimes be managed pharmacologically and also uh, resolved with time. Uh, so um, it's a good question, though, and it's it's one of the sort of more puzzling uh, of the things you can see rarely. There is a paper that was, or a poster at, at AGS, I believe, the year before last from Dr. Sean Lin at the uh, University of California at San Francisco, which basically looked at a series of about 40, uh, as he calls them, transient medriasis cases, because in this paper, they all pretty much resolved around three to six months. But I have heard of cases where they are permanent. So, you know, I think that Technique is a big issue here, avoiding that three and nine, definitely. So um, what about uh, neurotrophic keratitis? Or, you know, if we take that even a step further, kind of enhancement of dry eye symptoms. Yeah, so, you know, these are, these are sort of two, uh, two things. I think, um, I think it's possible to see worsening of dry eye uh, with this treatment. Again, in, in my mind, that's, that's a sign that maybe you're treating a little bit too anteriorly. Um, a posterior treatment should avoid the limbus and the limbal stem cells. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, I, I'm always reminding myself that patients get dry eye after cataract surgery. They sometimes get dry eye after iridotomy. So just the act of, of treating a patient will, in my mind, lead their 
mind, you know, to be more attentive to their surface. You can treat this dry eye like you treat other dry eyes with, you know, topical cyclosporin, lafitograph, you know, any of your standard treatments are very reasonable. I actually, you know, have, have felt that lafitograph, because it works quickly, uh, has, has been a good uh, thing to do. I use a fair bit of uh, tobramycin dexamethasone ointment if there's some inflammation uh, as well. Um, so, uh, again, the advice there, um, you know, and I will say in patients with very sick uh, eyes, and let's, let's say you have a patient with known stem cell deficiency uh, from aniridia or something like that, that might be a patient where you would avoid this laser and try to do something incisional because um, they're already so pushed over the edge with their own disease that um, that might be, you know, someone severe dry eye might be on my list of contraindications. Uh, for this laser, uh, unless I'm really stuck in a corner. Um, but again, treatable, uh, seems to get a little bit better with time, and I suspect related to anterior laser treatment. Okay. What about um, secondary glaucoma? Any of those that uh, you feel real comfortable treating with uh, micropulse, as well as any that you wouldn't want to treat? So contraindications in your mind that uh, are not micropulse candidates. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, let's just start off that, you know, um, I think that the, one of the benefits of this is that angle status is not going to determine whether or not you can use this, la this laser. So chronic angle closure uh, works great. You know, traditional diode has even been shown to improve visual acuity in, in chronic angle closure glaucoma patients. Uh, neovascular glaucoma, uh, this is a great treatment for that in my mind. Um, and uh, you have to be a little careful because, um, you know, if the angle is totally zipped up, uh, you may have to treat aggressively. As we know, many neovasculars will go on to tysis and hypotony, you know, without a laser. So uh, it's a little bit more of a risky playground, but I don't think, you know, I think the laser has value uh, for those cases uh, in particular because, because of its efficacy. Um, and I have to traditionally used higher laser settings in neovascular, and I don't have a problem with chronic hypotony. Um, that said, so, you know, what immediately comes up then is, well, what about uveitic glaucoma? Uh, and this is difficult because, you know, you're, you're using a laser that incites some inflammation to be sure in an eye that already has more inflammation than is desired. Um, so, you know, I would not say never use it, uh, in those situations. Uh, and, and I have used it in eyes with a history of inflammation. Um, I would just say this probably wouldn't be your first line therapy. Uh, I would, I would, you know, veer towards incisional therapy in an eye with a history of inflammation. Uh, if I were really stuck, namely an eye with scar conjunctiva, and uh, you know, incisional surgery simply wasn't possible. Um, the inflammation was reasonably well controlled, or at least not the biggest threat to their vision. Yes, I, I would consider treating a patient with micropulse. It just wouldn't be the first place to go. Uh, and I've had, in the uveitis I have treated, um, it hasn't incited a new round of inflammation, but, you know, you never know whether you just got lucky uh, or, or what's happening there. Um, with respect to macular edema, uh, same story. Um, you know, I've had patients where they've had a history of macular edema, vein occlusion, things like that. I've treated with micropulse. It hasn't come back. So I don't think it's a guarantee it's coming back. I just think there's a risk and you should be monitored, at the very least, monitoring the macula and probably prophylactically treating with NSAIDs, which seem to work the best at reducing CME. What are your thoughts on angle recession? Yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, I, I think that's exactly, uh, again, you know, angle recession eyes. One of the cases I almost presented was a traumatic glaucoma patient who had uh, vitreous that was coming forward. You know, and, and you put a tube in that eye, and the, the vitreous will come to the tube. And then you end up doing a vitrectomy, and you know, at that point, you're taking the cataract out. And um, you know, in those eyes, it can be just so much more straightforward to just do this laser, leave the eye unopened, and you know, save all those other problems uh, for another day. So I think angle recession is a great example of eyes that's really well treated uh, here. Now, I, I think one of the other, I mean, we don't really see it very often, but silicone oil induced glaucoma yeah. is one where, you know, the laser works extremely well. 
But the caveat is you have to remember if the oil is going to be removed, you can't take back what you did. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're starting with a pressure of 40, 45, 50 millimeters of mercury, and you try to treat them to a target, um, when that oil comes out, you're going to be left with an eye that's hypotenuse because you can't take that treatment away. So it's important to understand that you're going for a middle safe zone in silicone oil and not trying to go all the way to a great pressure because you can move a lot of fluid, but you can't take back that yep. treatment once you deliver it. Um, yep. And then one, one of the other ones recently that had a great paper is, you know, post penetrating keratoplasty yep. and using this in uh, glaucoma patients there it's important to also remember you probably shouldn't treat over if there's a tube in place uh, or a prior trabeculectomy in place unless it's really scarred down and has been that way for a long time. So there are some call outs, but the, you know, there, those are two kind of areas where it really works very, very nicely. One yeah, question I agree. is how, oh, thanks. how about pediatric glaucoma or congenital yeah. glaucoma? Now we do see a great deal of it, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a paper that was published comparing traditional tube shunts to uh, diode laser continuous wave in pediatric glaucoma. And, you know, this study actually showed the two treatments to be equivalent. So, you know, I then moved from that to say, well, do I think micropulse is safer than continuous wave? In other words, if I had a child that needed to be treated with one or the other, uh, I would choose micropulse. Um, and, and so, um, I think again, I, where I would probably put this as, you know, and again, you always want to be careful, uh, kids, you know, kids, kids have a long time to live. Um, I would certainly do it, uh, if I had a situation that called for it, uh, tube shunt surgeries in small eyes with small anterior chambers, uh, frequently have corneal decompensation as, um, you know, as a complication and, you know, the need for a corneal transplant, which was, you know, um, gosh, I want to say it was 11% of the tube versus trab eyes. And these are bigger adult eyes, you know, tube shunt was associated with the need for, you know, persistent corneal edema. Uh, but when you think of the effects of needing a corneal transplant on a young child in the embryogenic phase of their life, um, that eye is just not going to be the same if the cornea touches the, the endothelium, they need a transplant. So, um, you know, it's obviously a tough venue, but I think it, it is a reasonable therapy to be thrown in there. This might be a good time to use cautious settings, take it slow, explain to the parents that there are going to be multiple treatments. You know, maybe this would be a time where you, uh, you only treat half a quadrant, see what you get, and then come back, you know, or half, half the eye, uh, come back later. Um, just because we don't have the mountain of evidence uh, that we do for adults, um, but again, the alternatives aren't always that ideal in peds. And so, you know, uh, I guess you know, proceed with caution. Very good. Can you describe your typical post-op follow-up schedule and how soon you typically begin to see the pressure to reduce and potentially how do you implement removing glaucoma medications as you move forward during that post-operative period? Yes, it's a great question. So again, I don't see them day one. Um, and, um, you know, at that point, I, ju I just figure I've sort of done what I can for the pressure. Um, and uh, it's time to let the eye respond. Uh, I put them on prednisolone QID for the first week. I see them at week one, sometimes week two. And, uh, you know, then I will uh, so sort of see how they're doing. And, um, I think at week two, you usually are seeing a response, uh, and it would, it would fall into several categories. I mean, sometimes I'll see an exaggerated response. So if I have hypotony at week two, like a pressure of six, I'm not at all worried. Um, I have no cases of early, long, like persistent hypotony that stayed with the patient. Um, I, sure, I've got neovascular eyes that five years later went typical, but I don't blame the laser for that. Um, so... So if, if they're low at week two, I simply start taking away meds. Um, I, you know, and again, if they're on three meds and their pressure is six, I'll stop two, but probably leave them on one. Um, you can have a very, um, 
uh, expanded follow-up though. So if you see someone at two, two weeks, I'll say, you know, why don't you come back in a month and uh, stop the pred if your eye gets sensitive to light, you know, to go back on it. Uh, but I don't feel the need to see these patients very frequently in the post-op period. Um, and that's also a big difference, obviously, from incisional surgery. So, again, a patient who can't come back as frequently is a better candidate. Every once in a while in my practice in the Bronx, I'll have someone who will have a pressure of 55, and they will basically say, I am getting on an airplane, you know, tomorrow. Um, and I'll die that day. And, uh, you know, I won't see them again for two months, but I'd rather they get their treatment um, than, than have a pressure of 50, you know, for two months. So, um, again, there's, you have much more leeway in the follow-up. Again, and, and they can also be co-managed much more easily because, you know, no one's going to need to stick a needle in their eye or reform the chamber, inject viscoelastic, or anything like that. Very good. How often or when do you start to consider retreating them? And how often or how many times have you retreated a patient? Yeah, re retreatment, uh, you know, I do try to get in on the first time. Uh, I have some patients where the strategy is retreat, meaning I sort of say to them, hey, I'm going to go with light settings at first. I'm not sure if it'll be enough for you. And, you know, if I end up needing to do this twice, you know, don't, um, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't hate me. Um, I, I think that's, it's always a good way to go because then when you need to retreat, they're so much more comfortable getting the retreatment than if it's a surprise. Um, my retreatment rate, though, having said that, is, is I think was 10% in my long-term series. And um, I, I just don't do it a lot because I, I use those more aggressive settings. Um, if I'm going to retreat, I think I want about at least three months uh, because you don't want to be surprised. Having said that, I, realistically, I think you can retreat as soon as six weeks if you're really back into the very high levels. I've never seen anyone come down profoundly after being high at six weeks. Um, and I always have the power uh, because, I, again, the, you know, this is my ECP experience, but, you know, if you've lasered someone's um, ciliary processes with the endoscope, uh, again, that's the same 810 laser. It's a different uh, technique, but... Um, if you simply pass over with the same laser power an area that you already treated, nothing new happens. But if you increase the power, you'll see additional contraction of the ciliary processes as the few areas of uh, pigmented ciliary body left absorb the additional energy. So, you know, you want to go up on power or treat longer. And um, I will, uh, I'll, you know, if I did 2000, I'll maybe go, you know, 2300. Um, depending again on some of those factors, but uh, there's nothing that makes me feel more comfortable treating someone with 23, 2400 milliwatts than someone who had, you know, no light sensitivity, no iritis after a 2000 milliwatt treatment. It's very safe to go up in power on those. those eyes. When it's safe, do you adjust or stop systemic anticoagulants? Um, and, you know, due to the block or due to other situations? And, and what do you use actually for your block? So I, um, I uh, when I'm treating, um, I use uh, for the block, okay, my, my anesthesiologist blocks patients in one of my offices. He uses bupivacaine 50-50, 0 0.5, you know, 75% uh, with lidocaine. Uh, no epi, you know, pick your concentration, 2%. You know. um, in my office, though, I would usually just use lidocaine, 2%. And, and the reason I like that is because if, if I'm doing it in my office without anesthesia around, it's actually nice to be able to, um, uh, you know, to be able to have the patient recover their vision before I send them out for the day. And um, so, you know, again, I think, I think it's, it's either one. In terms of the treating with the anticoagulants, uh, you know, it's, it's always a judgment call, but, but yes, I've blocked plenty of eyes that are on Coumadin or aspirin. Again, if you're there and, you'll be, you know, you feel like they're having a retrobulbar hemorrhage, then, you know, you're going to have to manage that, but that's how it is with every block. Uh, so I will do it. Obviously, if I think it can be safely stopped, um, I, that's a preferred way to go. But, 
you know, between that and patients, every day it seems when I'm operating, I'll have a patient uh, with a pressure of 45 who forgot to take their aspirin or their Coumadin. And in most cases, I feel that it's better to preserve the optic nerve than to worry about the risk of, you know, severe bleeding. And, and in, in every case, really, the, the patients have been fine. So we have a question, that, and I think this is a, an important one because it really sets up, I think, the success rate for you is, you know, what is your, your kind of goals and expectation talk with your patient concerning micropulse? Um, okay, so, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, uh, I basically, you know, in, in, you know, a lot of patients, you have to sort of first of all explain that this is an SLT laser. This is a different laser from the one they've had in the past. Um, I, uh, again, will sort of assess each patient in terms of how likely I think they are to get by with one therapy. I mean, someone who's got a pressure 45 on three drops uh, and Diamox, you know, you can't promise that patient anything, really. Um, and the last thing you want to do is treat so aggressively that, you know, the, the eye uh, gets pressure that's too low. So those are the people where I explain they have to do this twice. Um, again, I think, you know, you, you kind of want to tailor your consent a little bit. If it's, uh, you know, a young phacic individual, I think you want to talk about medriasis. You want to talk about dry eye. Um, if it's uh, someone who's maybe got worse vision, um, you know, severely reduced um, vision. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of less concerned about some of those things, and I'll maybe just talk to them about light sensitivity and, you know, how they're going to need to take drops after and the fact that they might need a second treatment. Um, you know, that said, I think, um, you know, the, the, I've, I've had very good results uh, in terms of the pressure. Uh, I think most of the patients who've had it, uh, are pretty happy. I think they, they definitely notice, you know, the, the difference in terms of um, not just visual recovery, but really how quickly they can go back to their uh, normal activities and not have to come into the office. And you know, that's something patients value quite a bit. How much inflammation do you expect to see postoperatively? Yeah, again, um, Again, just if, if you weren't here at the beginning when I when I said this, it's to me it's non-negotiable that the patient needs a steroid injection with micropulse. I wasn't always doing that, you know. And in those cases, you'd see four plus cell, uh, you'd see bags of fibrin occasionally in the anterior chamber. Uh, yeah, you know, that's really not okay. Uh, at that point, you'll spend so much time chasing after that inflammation. Um, in an eye that's had the dexamethasone at the time of the injection. Um, their eyes should be reasonably quiet. Again, I don't see them day one, uh, but by week one, you know, you'll see a rare cell or, or sometimes nothing. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's what you should expect. Um, again, expect a little more inflammation and pigmented eyes. But the one patient type that will not respond in any way to this therapy are patients with albinism. Uh, they don't have a melanin, and they don't absorb the laser energy, and uh, nothing will happen, including no inflammation and no pressure drop. Um, but so you can expect a little more inflammation uh, in, in darker-skinned individuals. Um, but again, if the patient at one week isn't um, asymptomatic in terms of photophobia and have an eye with only a rare cell or no cell, uh, I'll taper their steroids more slowly. But I would have to say at least 90% of the time I'm, I'm going to stop that steroid at week one. Any concerns with continuing PGAs post uh, micropulse in the immediate or post-operative period being, you know, pro inflammatory, any issues there? Thank you for asking that. No, I, I would not hesitate to continue prostaglandin analog. I, I don't believe the prostaglandin analogs, except for in exceptionally rare idiosyncratic situations, contribute to CME. I think thousands of people have been blinded because their PGAs have been stopped out of fear of CME when that fear is totally unjustified. I'd love to see that practice just completely abandoned. But certainly in this situation, you have no fear of using a prostaglandin. Now, why might I stop the PGA first? Well, because PGAs make the eyes red, we know that for sure. And if a patient's trying to decide whether they can stop their prednisolone and they're using a drop that makes their eye red, it might get confusing. 
so you know I'm, I'm all in favor of um, using a fixed combination rather than a PGA in the post-operative period just to keep the eye less red but I don't think this the PGA causes any real issues with either inflammation or CME very good um, in your experience uh, loss of best corrected visual acuity so what have you seen there Yeah, so, um, you know, you, you've got a couple of things here. One is that, you know, you're treating glaucoma, and a lot of these patients, at least in my practice, have fields that are right on fixation, like, like some of the images I showed. Um, and when we look at, um, when we look at um, you know, other things, um, the, the thing I think that's most likely to cause you to lose a line or two might be dry eye. Um, you know, I mentioned the glaucoma. I do always worry about blocks. And, you know, the, the main problem with a block and loss of visual acuity is that you're really not going to ever be able to diagnose that because there's no way to prove it was the block. Um, and I think it is rare. Uh, but, but, of course, it's always on the differential. Um, and uh, I have certainly seen what I would call classic snuff with micropulse, just as I see it with my tube shunts, uh, you know, seemingly all the time. These are eyes that come in with a pressure of 55, and their field is already non-existent, yet they somehow still are seeing 2050. You think, wow, I can't keep them at 55. I've got to do something. You do your laser, your tube, and then their vision gets worse anyway. And I, I tend to think of those eyes as dead men walking where the vision loss was coming, and you just happen to be the one who did something before it occurred. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I'll explain it in just that language to patients, hopefully before the laser. Hey, I'm worried you may still get worse even if I do this laser, but don't you think we should do it anyway? That goes a long way. Uh, and if you say that, of course, document it to yourself so that when it happens, you can, can remind yourself you discussed it with the patient. Um, uh, CME, in my experience, again, extremely rare, but, you know, get the MAC OCT. And, of course, when you're getting the MAC OCT, look at the signal strength. And if you have an eye with a low signal strength, then it's probably dry eye or something else. Um, I don't do this a ton of times on phacic patients, but of course, cataract can always develop. Um, I think it it's, doesn't have to develop. I have patients who've avoided it, um, but again, that's another potential cause of uh, blurred vision. So. Have, so we had one question about uh, in combination with cataract surgery. Uh, do you have any experience uh, with combo-like, MIGS-like procedures with micropulse? Absolutely. Yep. Um, so, um, yeah, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that. There are a couple of situations where I use micropulse, uh, not as a standalone, but with other procedures. Uh, one that I do fairly frequently is uh, if there's a patient who I really think would benefit from a bare belt tube shunt, but I'm also nervous that I'm not getting the immediate pressure reduction, uh, I will combine a bare belt with micropulse. And, you know, you, you may look at that and say, wow, you know, that's a recipe for hypotony. Uh, and so, yes, you have to pick those patients really carefully. This is someone who's on at least four agents. Um, this is someone who uh, has severe disease, someone who needs a pressure of 10. Um, and uh, someone maybe with the pressure 28 coming in where I'm, I don't want to do an omid, but I want that, you know, immediate pressure reduction. Um, so I'll combine that. And some, some of those patients have cataracts. But, yes, I've done things, uh, micropulse with, with say, uh, you know, an high stent or a goniotomy um, and a phaco at the same time. And, again, that would be for someone with maybe on three drops with borderline pressures, heavy, moderate glaucoma, or maybe severe glaucoma that's reasonably well controlled, but on too many drops. Um, I think it, it works very well uh, in that setting, um, you know, again, along with uh, other traditional cataract and MIGS procedures. Uh, and I like that too, because, you know, you can give the eye uh, a nice dose of steroid, um, maybe even, you know, I'll use some uh, trimoxy, which is uh, intraocular triamcinolone with a cataract surgery and the micropulse. That seems to control the inflammation really well. Um, so in a, another time when I find myself frequently using micropulse is repairing tube erosions, repositioning tubes, any situation where there's been an Ahmed valve um, and the, uh, the tube 
uh, you know, the pressure's borderline, so I'm going to fix the tube, and then let's let's get them off one or two drops with, with a standard micropulse treatment. Uh, seems to have really good success with that. Um, so I, I did uh, look at my data to see if the, the patient being having had an Ahmed made micropulse work better, and it, I couldn't find that. So micropulse works just as well in eyes that have never had an Ahmed valve as in eyes that have had an Ahmed uh, previously. Uh, now I know that you you primarily have a glaucoma practice where you know this question might be a little loaded, but what are your thoughts on quote unquote good seeing eyes? And so that's different in every practice, but I think more so here, you know, 2020, 2030, 2040 seeing eyes. How do you feel about micropulse there? And what do you also think about in combination with a cataract extraction? Yeah. So. Well, well the, yeah. To be clear, if I didn't make it clear, I, I I think in combination with cataract extraction, is you know, as long as I've got glaucoma that justifies it, is um, is uh, you know, it's a good treatment. It works very well, and so I would reserve it for the cases where I need a little bit more than I think I'm going to get with the eye stent. Um, so to to be clear, though, I, I think we have to treat this differently from. SLT, right? You know, my consent for patients for SLT is, you know, gosh, this is basically a procedure without side effects. I mean, it, it is exceptionally rare to have iritis even um, that lasts more than a few days with SLT. Um, you know, it's, it's a very safe procedure. Uh, and, and this is not, you know, the same safety profile. You, you know, you madriasis, the, you know, a little bit of dryness that you see, um, you know, in some of these things, uh, we want to push it back uh, to the appropriate place. And so um, I will absolutely use this on 2020 eyes uh, that have serious glaucoma, that have uh, uncontrolled glaucoma, that are on many medications where those medications are creating side effects and problems that are affecting the patient's quality of life. Um, I am not out there to be clear saying, uh, you know, hey, your eyes a little red on that prostaglandin analog, you know, let's do micropulse. Uh, I just think that's too early. Um, and so I think we want to be respectful of the fact that this is a really efficacious, kind of convenient um, and good therapy, but one that still has, uh, as does everything with any efficacy, you know, its own risks. And we want to just place it in the right spot because um, ultimately, you know, and certainly if you're new to micropulse, you know, pick pick your cases appropriately. This is one situation where uh, I think it's fine to start with eyes with blurred vision, get your settings down, get comfortable, take a look at the eye, see what kind of effects you're getting, see what kind of inflammation you have, see what kind of dry eye you see, and then say, you know what, I know what I'm doing. Now I'll start treating some people with, you know, better vision, you know, using the settings that I'm comfortable with. That's the right way to do this. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to buy this machine and just sign up all your patients um, you know, who are on one drop uh, right from the beginning. Very good. Well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We do try to keep these to one hour or a little bit over. So I'll give uh, Dr. Radcliffe one last chance for any closing thoughts, and then we will end the webinar. Uh, we do record them, so this will be up on our, web our website so you can access it if you had any problems or um, you wanted to have any clarifications. And of course, we're always available for questions if so. Dr. Radcliffe? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, you know, as I said, this has been a four year, I think it's been four years uh, adventure for me. Uh, I still see the first patient that I treated, uh, definitely one of the first in the US who was treated. He's doing well. Um, which is good because his kids go to the same summer camp as mine. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I uh, welcome any, any follow-up. Um, you know, I think most of you can find my email address. It's Dr. Radcliffe at Gmail. Uh, I'm happy to chat with you offline about any particular cases. I think if you're new, it's never a bad idea to run uh, a case by a colleague and get their thoughts on settings. Uh, because the settings make all the difference. That's also what's great about micropulse is it's titratable. So uh, with that, I will thank you for your time. Thanks for the scientific uh, explanation of how this is working, Kevin. I think it's all the things you talked about are really important, and some of them are lessons I learned the hard way. Um, but uh, with that, I'll thank you all for your time. Well, thank you, Dr. Radcliffe, and 
thank you for joining us this evening for the webinar. Uh, I hope it was informative, but like I said, if you have any additional questions, we're always available for you, so please look us up. And that will conclude the Iridex MicroPulse webinar. Thank you. Thank you.